has found a resting place. 528. a joy and delight to have Reverend Ken Olson with us to share God's word. As you know, he's an active missionary in Brazil, before that in Cameroon, a man of many talents and publishes a fundamentalist newspaper down in Brazil in Portuguese. He's currently on his uh, furlough right now, on deputation, and uh, it is exciting to have him here in the States. As you know, he headed up the uh, second half of the International Council of Christian Churches Congress down in Brazil and uh, did a magnificent job of that. It was a, a wonderful time uh, as we gathered together in Serra Negra with other fundamentalists and uh, from all over the world. And uh, Brother Olson was in charge of that outreach. Uh, he also spoke at our ICCCNA, the North American branch of the International Congress, a Council of Christian Churches just a couple of months ago. And the message that he brought, I thought, was incredibly appropriate for us as Christians living in this time, and particularly right now, right before the elections of this week. And so I asked him if he would bring that message again, and he has graciously assented to do so. And so, Brother Olson, bring us God's word.
Well, I'd like to speak on the subject this morning of being a Christian soldier, being a soldier. And the title of the message this morning is, There is a War On. And of course, with the elections this week, uh, we have a war on, the war of good versus evil. And uh, we need to be soldiers in that war, at least to the extent of casting our vote, informed vote for the right people that are going to govern according to God's word. Let's turn back in our Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3, being a Christian soldier, soldier. Uh, We had our scripture reading earlier and told about the situation that we live in today. It talked about this though also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And then it gives a long list of sins in the last days. And I believe we're living in the last days today, and uh, it's those kind of days where sin is all around us. And in this environment that we live today, we need to be soldiers for the Lord, soldiers. And you know, being a soldier is not very popular in the church today. It's not very popular at all. It's like back in the time of the Vietnam War. Back in the Vietnam War, especially being a soldier was not popular. The soldiers would come back from Vietnam and they'd be spit upon and derided. And uh, people didn't care much for the soldiers. Many people didn't. And, uh, you know, we're in that situation today in the church. People don't want to be soldiers today. Let's see Second, Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be soldiers. We're supposed to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ, and as we're good soldiers, we're supposed to endure hardness. Well, what does a soldier do? What does he do? He fights against the enemy. He fights. It's a very unpopular thing in the church today to fight, but... We are called upon to fight evil. We're called upon to fight the false teachers, false doctrines, the wolves in the sheep's clothing. We are called upon to be soldiers. And then we go over to chapter 4. Chapter 4 and verse 2. Chapter 4 and verse 2. This tells a little bit about how we're supposed to be soldiers. And of course the Bible tells us that we're fighting against Not against flesh and blood, but we're fighting against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And we go down to chapter 4 and verse 2. It says, Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. Then down to verse 4. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And that's where we are today. People are turned unto fables. They have turned away from the truth. So what do we need to do? We need to be soldiers. The church as a whole needs to be a a body of soldiers, and each individual Christian needs to be a soldier as well, Uh, more or less, at least to some extent. And we're supposed to preach the word. We're supposed to reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. And as I said, nobody wants to hear about being a Christian soldier today. Today is a day of accommodation. People don't want to fight anymore. People only want to hear positive things today. But you know, as we just read the scripture passage from 2 Timothy chapter 3, it's a little bit of a negative passage, isn't it? Uh, False accusers, fierce traitors, heady, high-minded, all list of sins, and that's what we have around us here in America today. Of course, here in America today, as the pastor brought up a little bit ago, you know, we really deserve the bad government that we have in the United States today. We deserve the bad uh, legislators, the bad uh, people in power. We deserve that because of the sins of our society, but we're praying unto God that he might be gracious unto us. And we're, we have to fight in the good fight, trying to have a better government as much as we can. And you know, I'm a missionary down there in Brazil, 
And when we first went down there to Brazil, I was talking to a man down there, and he said he used to be a Christian soldier. He used to, in fact, he said he had Dr. McIntyre himself in his house down in Brazil, and he uh, used to like to uh, get involved in our confederation of churches down there, but he said he's quit all that because he's decided, well, what did I ever accomplish by fighting? What did I ever accomplish? And what I need to do now is I need to just do positive things, preach the gospel, win souls to the Lord, and forget about all that fighting stuff. Well, that's a nice thing to say. That's nice logic. But the problem is that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that we are supposed to be fighting, that we are supposed to be soldiers. And it's clear about that in many places. That that's what we're doing in our Christian life. One of the great things that we should be doing is fighting in the fight against evil. And you know, this church in particular here in Collingswood has a great history of that down through the years. But we see how few people are interested in that today. And fewer and fewer all the time. Down in Brazil and here in the United States, the prevailing philosophy today is anything goes. No matter what it is, it's all right. I'm okay, you're okay. And in Brazil, they tell us uh, the church sign doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter what the sign is on your church, whether you're Presbyterian, Baptist, uh, uh, Episcopalian, Catholic, uh, Mormon, no matter what you are, it doesn't matter. Because all the churches are good and nobody wants to fight anymore. But you know, Christianity... Yeah, when we look at the Bible, it's, some, it's a religion that's not pacifist. It's a religion that fights for what we believe in, both on the physical and also on the spiritual level. And here it says in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Is it hard to be a soldier? Is it hard? And I don't think it's by accident that the Bible uses the picture of a soldier. You know, mankind's history down through the centuries has been one long string of wars and soldiers going to war. And is it a, an accident that the Bible uses that illustration of being a soldier? And a soldier's life is hard. And I want to give a few things from historical examples of being a soldier this morning. And, uh, you know, on a physical level, being a soldier is hard. Here I want to give you a quote from a book by the name of Company H, A Soldier's Life. And here are just one of the common soldiers in the Civil War. Sam Watkins decided that he would write a book about being a common soldier in the war because he said all the others that wrote were the generals and the people high up. But he wanted a common soldier's picture of the war, the Civil War. And here's what he said. He said, a soldier's life is not a pleasant one. It is always at best one of privations and hardships. The emotions of patriotism and pleasure hardly counterbalance the toil and suffering that he has to undergo in order to enjoy the patriotism and pleasure. Dying on the battlefield in glory is about the easiest duty a soldier has to undergo. It is the living, marching, fighting, shooting soldier that has the hardships of war to carry. When a brave soldier is killed, he is at rest. The living soldier knows not at what moment he too may be called on to lay down his life on the altar of his country. The dead are heroes, the living are but men compelled to do the drudgery and suffer the privations incident to the thing called glorious war. And so Sam Watkins here, he said that a soldier's life is not a pleasant one. And if we're really soldiers here for the Lord today in today's world, it's not going to be a pleasant life that we have as well. And it's a little bit too much like work, like work being a soldier and with cost to pay for being a soldier. And uh, one other illustration of physical soldier, uh, what it's like is uh, here's a letter to a man's mother, to a soldier's mother during the Boer War around 1900. 
And here this soldier writes to his mother, The infantry soldier sees nothing except the man on either side of him and the enemy in front. He hears the crackle of the enemy's fire somewhere. He does not know where. And he hears the put put of the bullets. And every now and then he knows vaguely someone near him is hit. He feels the smell of the powder and the hot oily smell of his rifle. He fires at the range given and at the given direction. And every now and then he hears advance. And he gets up and goes on and wonders why he is not hit as he stands up. That is all. Then the bullets cease to come and the action is over. He marches to the chosen camping ground and perhaps goes on picket, very tired and dirty. And he does it all again the next day. That is the infantry soldier's battle. Very nasty, very tiring, very greasy, very hungry, very thirsty, everything very beastly. No glitter, no excitement, no nothing, just bullets and dirt. Well, I think that's a good description of being a soldier in the physical realm. And it's the same way in the spiritual realm. It's not an easy job being a soldier, and nobody wants to do it today. But here Paul tells Timothy, and he's telling us today in the church, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And the soldier is called upon to do his duty. Do his duty often in the corner somewhere. He doesn't really see the overall picture, but he knows the commander's in control, and he just is told to advance. He's told to go on, and he does it. And he has to suffer hard, hardness. You know, Paul, he gave us a long list of all the things he suffered in his ministry. He endured perils in the deep, perils by his own countrymen, perils by false brethren, uh, hungry, thirsty, all these different things Paul endured as a Christian soldier. You know, we were in Africa before we went to Brazil, and... Uh, you know, when we were getting ready to go to Africa, people would ask us, are you excited to get over to Africa? Are you excited to be going now? Well, in one sense, they were asking this because we had prepared for a while and we were finally ready to go. And they were very well-meaning by this question. But, you know, when they asked me that question, I, I thought, you know, excited is not the word that I would use to describe going to Africa as a missionary. Because I had a good idea of what we were getting into over there. And it was going to be a hard job over there. It was going to be hard with disease, snakes, heat, language, work, all kinds of problems. And I was ready to go. I was ready to do my duty as the soldier is ready to go and to do his duty. But excited is not exactly the term I would use. And you know, it's just like in the beginning of the Civil War or many other wars. You know, uh, at the beginning of the war, the men, they're all excited to get into battle. They're all excited to go and they're all worried that the war will be over before they get in. But you know, who are the guys that are really excited about getting into the battle? Well, they're the ones that have never been there. They're the new soldiers. The old hands are not excited to go into the battle. But they're ready and they're ready to do their duty. You know, it's dangerous being a soldier, dangerous. And there's cost to be paid being a soldier on a spiritual level. You know, if we actually fight against evil, if we actually fight against false doctrine, if we actually try to be a soldier, we'll have a tax made upon us. People will call us too narrow. Oh, that person's too narrow. Or he's an extremist. Or he's a radical. Or he's lunatic fringe. You know, if we are actually trying to be a soldier and fighting against evil, well, we'll be persona non grata with most churches and most Christians, let alone the world around us. Many times we'll have costs to pay in our family and problems when we try to be a Christian soldier. Now we go on to verse 4 of chapter 2. Verse 4 of 2 Timothy. No man that warreth 
entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Once again, God has chosen us as Christians to be soldiers. At least, at least a little bit, we're chosen to be soldiers. Everyone's supposed to be a soldier, at least to a certain extent. Some more, some less. The church as a whole is supposed to be a body of soldiers, an army, uh, fighting for the war, in the war. And you know, we are in a war today. We are in a war against the devil, against his minions, against uh, principalities, against powers. We are in a war. And a lot of times we go to sleep and we think we're not in the war, but we really are in that war today. And we get distracted. Uh, last time I was here, I preached on being too connected to the media. And that's very true, and that's one way to be distracted away from the war that we really are in. And you know, we need to plug our resources into the war. Today is not a day to sit back and enjoy our luxury. Uh, many people have the idea, many Christians have the idea, well, God, if God has prospered me and given me a lot of things, he wants me to just sit back and enjoy these things. Well, that's not how it is. We're in a war, and we need to use our resources in that war. And it's not a time to sit back in luxury. You remember back with Elisha, back in the Old Testament. Elisha, he healed Naaman the Syrian. Now, I told him how to get healed. And remember, uh, he wouldn't accept any gifts from the Syrian. But then his servant went along and chased after the Syrian and got some gifts. And when his servant came back, Elisha said to him, Is it a time to receive silver and gold? Is it a time to receive men servants and maid servants and to sit back in luxury? And it wasn't time then, and it's not time now. You know when's the time for us to sit back in luxury and enjoy things and forget about the war? It's when we go to heaven and we're done with the war down here. When we go to heaven, it'll be a time for rest, for reward. But now is not that time. We need to keep fighting till the end of our lives, all the way till the end. Uh, you might remember uh, when I showed slides of our work in Brazil, I pointed out a man there by the name of Dr. Silas. He was in one of our meetings there as president of our confederation in Brazil. He was 80 years old, and I had a picture of him there three weeks before his death. He was still in the meetings, still being president of our uh, confederation. He was still fighting clear till the end. And we put out an article about him in our little paper, and we said that a great soldier had fallen in the battle. And that's exactly true. Dr. Silas had fallen in the battle. He was still in the battle, clear at 80 years old, and he was still fighting, and he fell in the battle. And we need to keep on fighting till the end of our lives. Of course, as we get older, we can't fight as much, but we can still fight a little bit. And you know, being a soldier involves, involves sacrifice, sacrifice. It involves sacrifices in our family. Uh, many times it involves sacrifices for pastors. If a pastor wants to be a real good soldier who wants to fight in the battle against evil, he's not going to be very popular today. And the pastor is likely to be pastor of a small church today because people don't want to hear about being a soldier or fighting uh, for the things of the Lord. And, uh, you know, I have a, a, a quote, an interesting quote here or there about being comfortable and uh, not being willing to sacrifice uh, for what was right. And I have a quote here from Mark Twain. Mark Twain was not a Christian, but he had some interesting insight and ways of putting things sometimes. And here he talks about himself in his autobiography, and he says that he was in this position, in this newspaper as a job there, that he called, that he said it was shameful for him to be there. And he said... I was loftier 40 years ago than I am now. I felt a deep shame in being situated as I was, a slave of such a journal as the morning call. If I had been still loftier, I would have thrown up my berth and gone out and starved like any other hero. But I had never had any experience. I had dreamed 
uh, heroism like everybody else. But I had had no practice, and I didn't know how to begin. I couldn't bear to begin with starving. I had already come near to that over once or twice in my life and got no real enjoyment in remembering about it. I knew, knew I couldn't get any other birth if I resigned. I knew it perfectly well. Therefore, I swallowed my humiliation and stayed where I was. Well, talk, Mark Twain, he said he stayed in this shameful job because it was comfortable. And why do a lot of pastors stay in, in pastorates where they're not fighting, where they're not being soldiers? It's because it's comfortable. There's a price to be paid if we want to be a Christian soldier, if we want to fight. And you know, it's a lonely job being a Christian soldier. It's lonely. It was lonely back in Paul's time. Let's go to chapter 4 of 2 Timothy, chapter 4 and verse 11. Chapter 4 and verse 11. Here's what Paul had to say when he was being a soldier. 4.11 Only Luke is with me. Only Luke is with me. And then down to verse 16. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it might not be laid to their charge. And so here we have Paul saying that it was lonely for him when he was fighting the good fight, when he was being a soldier. And you know, it's lonely for us. The big churches today, the big crowds, are not interested in fighting. They're interested in accommodation. They're interested in saying, I'm okay, you're okay, everything's positive. Let's just comfort everyone and forget about sin and forget about things that are negative. But you know, we need to look at things that are negative. We need to uh, preach against evil. We need to fight against evil. We need to be Christian soldiers. And you know, during World War II, Churchill, he was trying to get the British people to fight against Hitler. This was before they actually went into war against Hitler. And the British people really didn't want to get into the battle. And Churchill was saying to the British people, he was saying, well, if we don't fight now, when there's a chance of success against Hitler, well, you know, we're going to have to fight later when there is no chance of success. And that's very true. You know, in our battle going around us today, we're losing today. We can just say that pure and simple. The church, the forces of good are losing today. We're losing the battle today, but we will win the war for sure. But today we're losing, but we still have to fight. And let's go over to chapter 2, chapter 2 of 2 Timothy, chapter 2 and verse 16. Chapter 2 and verse 16. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. You know, here we have the Apostle Paul, right here in Scripture, naming names as he fought for the Lord, as he was a soldier. He named names. He named Hymenaeus and Philetus, not only for right here, but for all time. And you know, that's something that no one likes to do today in the fight. No one likes to name names. They'd like to talk in vague generalities about evil, vague generalities about false teachers, about wolves in sheep's clothing, but never name names. But the Bible does name names. It's something negative, but it's something that needs to be done sometimes. You know, I can talk in generalities, and the people in the pews don't know who I'm talking about. They just don't know. But if I name names, they, they know exactly who we're talking about. Then we go over to chapter 4, the same thing, chapter 4 of 2 Timothy. And you know, 2 Timothy is the last book that Paul wrote in the Bible. And here's his parting testimonies, parting words to Timothy. Chapter 4 and verse 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou ware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. Here Paul names the name of Alexander the coppersmith. 
And he names his name, why? So that they could beware of him. He says to Timothy, to beware of this Alexander the coppersmith. That he's insidious, that he's an enemy. And you know, there are enemies in our, in our Christian warfare. There are enemies out there. That's who we're fighting against. We're fighting against enemies that are false teachers. That are promulgating false doctrines. We're fighting against the forces of evil. We're fighting against the forces of the homosexuals and, and the forces of abortion and whatever it is out there. We're fighting against them. And uh, we need to get into the fight. But today there's a different spirit than there was in years gone by. Somebody was uh, talking to me just before the service and they were talking about how this church was filled to capacity back 50 years ago or even 40 years ago, or somewhere like that. You know, that was a different time back then. A different time. And you know, today we have a different spirit. Today the spirit is one of accommodation. Anything goes. We see that down in Brazil with our confederation of churches down there. It's a, uh, the local confederation for Brazil of the ICCC. It's called CFE. We see that in Brazil. People have a different spirit. Even the very same people that fought in the past, they're not interested in fighting today. They're not interested in being involved today, even though they were in the past. It reminds me of another illustration of history from, with the French Huguenots back in the 1600s. And you know, the French Huguenots were being put down at that time. And the French Huguenots were down to just one stronghold in France called New Rochelle, La Rochelle there. The city of La Rochelle there, it was their last stronghold. It was being besieged uh, by the Catholics under Richelieu. And uh, they were being besieged there. And one of the great Protestant leaders, he went all over France trying to rally the Huguenots to come to the help of this last bastion of the Protestants there in France. And nobody was interested. Nobody was interested as he went all over France. The Protestants he spoke to, they weren't interested in fighting anymore. And he commented that there was a different spirit in France than there had been in the past. And so La Rochelle fell. And Protestantism was completely outlawed out of France a few years later, and the Huguenots had to flee for their lives, or they had to give up their religion uh, there in, and give up their service of the Lord there in France. And all power was, a, was concentrated in the Sun King, and Louis the Fourteenth, who said, uh, you know, uh, that he would, that all revolved around him. He said, "The state, it is me." Well, you know, we have to be uh, aware also that in this Christian warfare, that even those that should be our allies in this warfare are not interested in being our allies. And in many times, help the forces of evil. And you know, we are definitely in the minority, a small group, if we are interested in being soldiers for the Lord. And here I have another question, uh, quote here. Uh, from Luther, Martin Luther. And Martin Luther, he was a man that was a minority at the time he rose up. And, uh, and people were criticizing him because he was in the minority. And here's what he answered. Luther said, But say they, men of power, persecute you. Is it not clear, according to Scripture, that the persecutors are generally wrong and the persecuted right? that the majority has ever been on the side of falsehood and the minority on that of truth. Truth has in every age caused an outcry. And that's what Martin Luther had to say as the Reformation was getting started. And he was in a minority at that time, but the Lord blessed his efforts at that time. Uh, but anyway, he, he acknowledged the fact that he was in the minority, and truth is, is almost always in the minority. And uh, let's go to chapter 3, chapter 3 of Second uh, Timothy and verse 13. Here's where we are today, Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 
But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. So here we have, Timothy is told, that in the future, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And that's exactly what we have today. And what should we do in this environment that we live in today? Well, we need to keep up the fight. Even though we're on the losing side, the losing side today, we can see all around us that the homosexuals are on the march. We can see the homosexuals uh, being legalized, homosexuality being legalized in the military. Now they have Gay Pride Month in the, in the military. Uh, we have uh, homosexual marriage. We have all these things on the march. We are losing. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. But we need to keep on fighting. We keep on, need, keep on needing to be soldiers for the Lord. And then chapter 4 and verse 3. Here's where we are as well. Chapter 4 and verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. I love it how the King James puts that there. They will not endure sound doctrine. And that's exactly where we are today. People will not endure sound doctrine. Christians, people that call themselves Christians, will not endure sound doctrine today. They won't endure it. And they, after their own lusts, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And of course in Brazil we have that very bad with the prosperity preaching there. We have preachers telling people everything they want to hear. Not in the United States too. That everything they want to hear, that they're going to be healthy and wealthy. God's going to give them everything they want. Well, you know, what are we supposed to do when people are around us preaching all those things? Well, we're supposed to fight against these uh, preachers that preach these prosperity theology and other things. After their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Well, we shouldn't think it's strange that we're on the losing side in this battle today. Uh, it's prophesied that we would be on the losing side uh, toward the end. But Christ is coming back. Christ is coming back and he will win the whole war. And we will be on the winning side in the war. But right now, we're on the losing side. But we still need to fight. We still, still need to be in the battle. And you know, people will not endure sound doctrine. And the more sound the doctrine is, the less they will endure it, even Christians. But you know, I like to think of us today as being in a rear guard, fighting a rear guard action. As uh, we're being defeated, the forces of good are being defeated. But you know, with the Lord, a few people can count for a lot. A few people can count for a lot with the Lord. We see that all through the scriptures. The classic example, example of Gideon with 300. We have other classic examples in the Bible of Elisha. Elijah against uh, 450 prophets of Baal. And you know, uh, we can accomplish quite a bit, just a few of us, just a handful of us, if we really try to be Christian soldiers and fight for the Lord. And we need to counterattack today. We need to counterattack in many ways. Uh, going back to the Civil War, one of my favorite guys in the Civil War was Stonewall Jackson. And you know, Stonewall Jackson, he only ever lost one battle. And that was the Battle of Kernstown. And the reason he lost that battle was that he attacked a much larger Union force with a small, small force of his own. And he had faulty information at the time. But anyway, he attacked with a small force and was defeated by a much larger force. But you know, even in that battle that he lost, he accomplished a lot. He upset all the Union plans for that whole uh, time period. And they thought, well, if this guy here, if this Confederate will attack, he must have a lot of force behind him. He must have a lot of power. And they were all afraid. And you know, that's how we need to do as Christian soldiers. Even though we have just a few, just a little strength, we still need to counterattack and fight to win. Fight with our whole heart. Even though we know that we are losing this battle, but we will win the war. Uh, the Church of Philadelphia, back in the book of Revelation, the Church of Philadelphia was told that it had a little strength. It had a little strength. 
And that's exactly where we are today. The church today, the true church, is trying to fight for the Lord, has a little strength. But we need to use that for the Lord. And you know, we never can surrender in this battle. There's never a time when we can surrender. Even though we might be losing, we can't surrender. And we can, can't negotiate with the enemy. Negotiating, of course, in the sense of negotiating, of giving and taking. Uh, recently, my brother-in-law was in a court case, and the uh, uh, judge said to him uh, that he needed to go to mediation. And the, uh, the judge said to them when they went to mediation, he says, a good mediation is when everybody goes away unhappy. Well, uh, that's not the kind of mediation or negotiation we need to be in today with the forces of evil. Is we don't want to give up our doctrine. We don't want to give up the things of the Lord. We can never negotiate these things. We can never surrender. We have to keep fighting in the war. And then finally, we have a, one more illustration I want to, uh, quote I want to read about Luther again. And you remember the Reformation got started with Martin Luther and his great stand that he had there at the Diet of Worms, where the, the empire was there and Martin Luther was called before them and he was told to recant of what he had preached. And as he was going in there to that Diet of Worms, to that big meeting, uh, a great general was standing nearby. And as he was going into the meeting, this general said, Poor monk, thou art now going to make a more noble stand than I or any other captain have ever made in the bloodiest of our battles. But if thy cause is just, and thou art sure of it, go forward in God's name and fear nothing. God will not forsake thee. And that's what we need to do today. Even though we have just a little strength, we need to go forward in God's name and fear nothing. And finally, we want to look at our last scripture here, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7. Here's Paul's parting words in the last book of the last chapter of the last book he wrote. His parting words. And what did he say in his parting words? Chapter 4 and verse 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. What did Paul point to at the end of his life? His parting words, I have fought a good fight. Well, are we fighting a good fight today? Are we fighting against evil in the world around us? Are we fighting as a church? Are we fighting as individuals? Well, this church here in Collingswood has a great history of fighting against the forces of evil, against wolves and sheep's clothing, and we need to continue to do that today. A great part of our ministry in Brazil is a ministry of being Christian soldiers down there in our paper, the fundamentalists down there, we try to fight against the forces of evil, fight against false doctrine. And that's something that's very important and something that's forgotten in the church of today. Even in good fundamental churches, it's forgotten that we need to be fighting, fighting in this battle. And especially as we come to Tuesday, Election Day, let us do a little bit of fighting on that day. At the very least to fight by going to the polls and, well, first of all, a fight by finding out who to vote for, and then second of all, going to the uh, polls and voting for the candidates that are true to the principles of the Bible. That's what we need to do this week, and that's just a little bit we could do in the fight. But, you know, we need to always in our lives keep in mind that it's not anything goes. We have to fight against false doctrine. We need to point out to people that doctrines are not right, that uh, things aren't right in, in many other churches. And we need to point them to the true way, to the true faith of the Bible. Let us say, as, as the Apostle Paul did at the end of his life, I have fought a good fight. Let's bow in prayer. O oh Lord, we pray that thou would bless these words to our hearts. And O oh Lord, help us to fight a good fight. O oh Lord, help us to be in the fight. 
Help us to be fighting against the false things in our world around us and the forces of evil that are on the march. And, O oh Lord, we just pray that thou would be with us in this. In Jesus' name, amen.